Um, so next up, we're going to have um, Dr. Brian Halliday, and he's going to be talking about therapies for ICCs. So showing how our knowledge of the genetic causes of ICCs can help us tailor treatments um, to patients rather than just treating the symptoms, actually treating the root cause, which is a really exciting development. Um, I know a lot of my patients say once we give them the genetic diagnosis, well, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to fix this faulty gene? And um, at the moment, I guess we're still in the early stages of that. Um, but Brian's going to talk us through some of the novel and targeted therapies that are in the pipeline for treating ICCs. Um, he's a senior clinical lecturer in cardiology and cardiomyopathy and consultant cardiologist. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thanks very much, Ellie. Um, um, so yes, so it's, it's super to be able to, to speak again at this really wonderful programme and um, well done to you and Amas for putting it all together. Um, can, can you see my slides okay? Yes, and can hear you fine, super. thank you. Wonderful. Um, so, um, uh, this is what I'll talk about over the next 20 minutes or so. So um, I, I will talk about targeted therapies for, for inherited cardiac conditions. I'll, I'll focus on cardiomyopathies um, because this is where most of the action has been, but, but it is mostly about general principles. So we can apply these general principles to other forms of inherited cardiac conditions too. Um, so to begin with, I'll, I'll talk very quickly about our current therapies and, and the limitations that they have. And, and really the main limitation is that they target the consequence of, 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 of the remodeling that we see as a result of, 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 the, of the genetic um, changes rather than actually the cause um, of, of, of the problem. And I think we're moving towards a future where we target the cause rather than the consequence. Uh, and we do we we're, we do that, or we are beginning to do that through through two ways. One is is targeting the primary primary molecular consequences of of the genetic changes, um, and 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 the second one is is actually targeting um, um, the genetic changes themselves, either by um, correcting them, silencing, or, or or replacing them. So I will go into a little bit more detail about about each of these things. So before I begin to talk about um, how we target these diseases with therapies, I think we need to talk a little bit about the causes of, 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 of cardiomyopathies and other inherited cardiac conditions. This is just one of them, but dilated cardiomyopathy, um, dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and, and um, um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy are, 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 are all similar. Um, so, so they have both intrinsic disease mechanisms, so disease mechanisms driven by genetic changes. Those can either be very rare genetic changes or increasingly recognised the role of, of more common changes. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. And then the interaction of these intrinsic mechanisms, genetic mechanisms, um, with acquired um, stimuli or, or environmental triggers that really unmask these um, um, genetic mechanisms. So, so what about the genetic background of, of cardiomyopathy? So you may have seen this before, um, but, but really there's a spectrum of different um, genetic etiologies to cardiac conditions. On the left hand side of this diagram, we have monogenic conditions. OK, and, and they're the ones that Matt will have been referred to whenever he is talking about how we interpret variants. So these are variants that are extremely rare within the general population and they have very strong effects in isolation to produce a disease by themselves, okay? So these are the variants that we try to find in, in, in patients that will allow us to then offer relatives predictive testing because we think that these variants cause disease in isolation. And potentially if we're able to fix or correct these rare variants, we're able to produce very large effects on the disease. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we've got polygenic diseases, and, and, and these are caused by variants that occur commonly within the population. But because they occur, occur commonly in the population, they produce very, very weak effects. Um, and, and in isolation have, have very little effect on, on, the, on the risk of, of producing a disease. But whenever they occur together, their cumulative risk can increase someone's susceptibility. So we've got this spectrum of monogenic to polygenic, 
Back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we used to think that cardiomyopathies were caused by rare variants. They were monogenic conditions. But over the last 10 years and, and even more recently, just over the last five years, we're beginning to realise that actually there's a spectrum and, and um, individual patients can have both a rare variant cause OK, but but the risk of expressing that rare variant cause can also be um, um, increased by common variants and polygenic risk. OK, so, so moving on to therapy. So how do we currently treat therapies and, and taking dilated cardiomyopathy as the example? And, and we give patients heart failure therapies. So these heart failure therapies target the consequences of the disease. They target the heart failure syndrome that people develop because their heart has become weak. They, they target the neurohormonal consequences of having a weak heart. So they don't actually deal with the problem. They wait for the fire to, to, to emerge and then simply try to put out the fire when it does emerge. OK, and more and more we're beginning to find targeted therapies that actually target the genetic change themselves or the primary molecular mechanisms that emerge as a consequence of the genetic change. Um, and, and we have hope that this will be able to prevent disease expression or even reverse disease expression when it has emerged. So this really stops the fire from starting. OK. So if, if you're interested in this concept, this is a really wonderful paper that I'd um, advise you to, 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 um, um, to read. So it was published in, um, in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, Basic Translational Science um, very recently. And, and it talks really elegantly and quite simply um, um, about these concepts. So if we take monogenic diseases, we have single variants um, that produce disease in isolation. And as you've heard from Matt, we, we can look at the consequences of these variants. And these variants can either be a loss of function variant whenever um, not enough protein is produced, OK, or again a function variant or a missense variant whenever an abnormal protein is produced. And that protein then, um, the abnormal nature of that protein there that may, may turn out to, um, to, to be toxic or ha have a negative effect. So either we don't produce enough protein or we produce a protein that has an abnormal effect. And the way that we target these two types of genetic consequences is going to be different, OK? As a result of these genetic variants, then we have abnormal molecular consequences. So if the gene is a sarcomeric gene, so I'll talk a little bit about the sarcomere in a minute, but the sarcomere is the unit of contraction in the heart. It causes the heart to contract. If we have a problem with the sarcomere, then the heart's not going to contract as much. OK, that is the secondary effect. OK, and as a result of that, then we develop adverse remodeling and heart failure. Our current therapies target the bottom end of this pathway, OK? But we want to develop therapies that target the top end of this pathway and may be more effective. They may be more um, likely to prevent um, expression of the disease in the first place in, in, in patients at risk. And they may be able, be able to even reverse the disease process when we haven't been able to in the past. So there's lots of focus on sarcomeric therapies. OK, so what is a sarcomere? So the heart is an organ that, that pumps blood around the body. It does this because it's made up of cells called cardiomyocytes. And within the cardiomyocytes, we have a unit of contraction called the myofibril, OK, which is made up of sarcomeres. OK, and the sarcomeres um, cause the heart to contract because we get cross-linking of, of two fibres. So we've got the myosin thick filament, OK, and it has heads and it, the heads insert into the actin thin filament. And this um, process of cross bridging allows the heart to contract and then pump blood around the body. OK, so the sarcomere causes the heart to, to contract. And if we have um, genetic variants in sarcomeric proteins, we can get abnormalities in contraction. And again, this is a, another really lovely um, review article for others that are interested in it. We know that Genetic variants in sarcomeric proteins can produce dilated cardiomyopathy on the one side, but can also produce hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, so how do we determine, or, um, you know, which variants produce which phenotype? Okay, and it depends again on the consequence of the variant. So, if the variant causes a sarcomere to be hypocontractile, if it causes impaired contractility, reduced actin myosin cross bridging. 
then we get dilated cardiomyopathy. And if the diametric opposite of that is if the sarcomeric gene mutation or the genetic variant produces hypercontractility, increased actin myosin cross bridging, and that produces hypercontractility, enhanced contractility, and as a result of that, we get hypertrophy and fibrosis. Okay, so if we get variants in sarcomeric proteins with the diametric opposite effects, then we can get hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy. And this is the cause of the problem, the primary molecular pathway that drives disease. So um, um, now about seven years ago, some famous scientists in Boston set out to see if we could modify this process to reverse disease expression. So this was mouse models presented in seven, about seven years ago. Now I'm not usually too enthusiastic about mouse models, but, but I think this is a really wonderful one to emphasize. They looked if, if, if we could inhibit actin myosin cross bridging, in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, whether that would reduce, or in mice with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, whether that would treat hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So they invented a molecule that inhib inhibited actin myosin cross bridging and showed that the systolic function of, 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 of the mice's heart um, reduced. They also showed that if we gave mice this um, inhibitor of actin myosin cross bridging, we reduced the left ventricular wall thickness, we reduced the hypertrophy. So in red we see um, mice with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who didn't get any therapy and in the blue line we saw those that got the inhibitor um, of, of actin myosin cross bridging. And we also saw that the mice treated with, with the actin myosin cross bridging inhibitor had reduced fibrosis. OK, so we're able to prevent expression of the disease by inhibiting the primary molecular consequence of the genetic variant. And this has been really transformative because we've now had clinical trials of this therapy in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This therapy, by virtue of the fact that it inhibits the sarcomere, it reduces contraction of the heart. So the first patient population we looked at was patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Left ventricular outflow tract obstruction be occurs because of hypercontractility, over, um, overaction of, of the sarcomere. And we showed that by inhibiting that, we we're able to um, make patients feel better, reduce symptoms and improve their exercise tolerance. And this was because we reduced the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, and we also reduced other markers of heart failure like NT pro BMP. And in a subset of patients who had MRIs, we saw those treated with Mavicamptin, as we now call it, the, the, the myosin inhibitor, um, had a reduction in their left ventricular wall thickness. Okay. So these patients with full-blown hypertrophic cardiomyopathy had a reduction in the amount of left ventricular hypertrophy that they had. And this is the first suggestion that we may be able to even reverse the disease um, by using these types of drugs. Now, I have to take this with a pinch of salt because it's small numbers of patients um, and, and it is a specific subgroup of patients, but nevertheless, it's exciting. Now, we know that we can have the opposite to cause dilated cardiomyopathy. So can we activate myosin to treat sarcomeric dilated cardiomyopathy? So we knew that about um, 10 to 15 percent of patients with dilated cardiomyopathy have a what we call a truncating variant in Titan, so a loss of function variant in Titan. Titan is the largest protein in the human body that spans the length of the sarcomere and acts to regulate and generate contraction. So it's not surprising that if we have a loss of function variant in Titan, then we're more susceptible to developing contractile dysfunction. And the question is, can we now use medications to activate sarcomeric um, um, function to then improve dilated cardiomyopathy due to truncating variants in Titan or other sarcomeric variants? And this is exciting because we have now two um, um, medications that, that activate myosin. And these suggest that, that in all comer populations of patients with heart failure, that they may have small positive effects. And the question that we now need to answer is, is, is whether they have exaggerated effects in patients who have heart failure because of, um, um, because of sarcomeric variants. So do we see exaggerated effects whenever we target the primary molecular cause um, of, of, of the problem? 
and this still remains to be answered, but 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 certainly is, is an exciting question. What about other types of dilated cardiomyopathy? Well, we one type of dilated cardiomyopathy we get very anxious about is, is dilated cardiomyopathy because of Laman variants. Um, so the, the purple line is our, our patients with Laman variants and they have a very bad prognosis. OK, and we know it because of, again, studying this disease in mice and animals that they have upregulation of a protein called MAP kinase, which 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 then drives the disease process in, in animals so that we now have a MAP kinase inhibitor. And, and we had a small phase two trial that suggested that inhibiting MAP kinase in patients may be able to improve their exercise tolerance or reduce their nt pro bmp levels. Unfortunately, we've just had a phase three trial, so a later phase trial, which didn't show, you know, more robust markers of improvement in these patients. So our first trial in this area has failed, but but hopefully we'll have more therapies that target this in the future that, that will succeed. So what about gene based therapies? So uh, again, there's three different types of gene based therapies, and this depends on the type of genetic variant that we see. OK, so for those patients with loss of function variants, they don't produce enough protein or the protein that they produce is, is not functional. There's a potential to rescue this by um, giving the patient um, viruses or vectors that, that package the gene, OK, that, 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 that is then able to replace the, um, um, the, the, the lower levels of, of, of protein in the body or, or the dysfunctional protein. OK, so we get a gene replacement therapy for loss of function variants. We get a gene silencing therapy for those um, missense variants that produce abnormal toxic protein or abnormal protein that, 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 that is enhanced. So we have um, we can give small interfering RNA molecules OK, um, that then enter the cells, target the, the abnormal protein and cause it to be degraded. So we can have gene silencing therapy. And the final one that is that is um, more recent is, is is whenever we use something called CRISPR-Cas9 to go into the cell and and edit the very specific site um, um, of, of of the genetic variant and insert the correct genetic code so that we repair um, um, the defective gene. Now, what are we using these for at the moment? Well, uh, the, uh, perhaps the most advanced area is 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 for hyperlipidemia therapy. So we know that PCSK9 plays an important role in 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 causing high cholesterol levels, and and a group in America have have used nanoparticles to target um, PCSK9 in the liver, um, and 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 um, and 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 reduce it. OK, so they target PCSK9, they edit it and, um, and they are able to reduce PCSK9 in primates. OK, so not humans yet. Um, and this um, allows us to e edit the genetic code and reduce LDL levels. OK, so this is really exciting. It's potential potential to 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 give patients one therapy to edit their genetic code on one occasion and reduce LDL lifelong. And this is now being given to one human, so we have a first in man study and, and we may see it in the future. We also have um, small interfered RNA mo molecules that can target PCSK9, which again do the same job. And this has been shown in, in humans um, to reduce LDL um, for, you know, for, 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 for up to a year. So this is potential to give patients one or two injections every year to, to reduce LDL by by um, um, uh, by targeting PCSK9 um, in the liver and and um, um, it interfering with its um, with its translation. So what about TTR amyloidosis? So you're due to get a talk from from Mariana about this. So I haven't gone into it in too much detail, but TTR amyloidosis stands for transthyretin amyloidosis. OK, transthyretin is is a is a dispensable protein produced in the liver. It's usually produced in tetramers, but those tetramers can be unstable and and form monomers and those monomers can there then go on to form amyloid, which is deposited in our nerves and our heart and cause amyloidosis. And cardiac amyloidosis is a very nasty condition and um, that can cause progressive heart failure and death. 
So how can we target this? And of course we can target this in three different places. One is that we can use the same gene silencing therapy, small interfering RNA molecules, targeting um, the, the, the production of TTR in the liver. We can use TTR stabilizers, so we can stabilize the tetramers and prevent them degrading into monomers, um, or we can try to eliminate um, TTR deposits with, with monoclonal antibodies. And we've had a, a trial of TTR stabilizers in patients with TTR amyloidosis, and this has showed an outcome benefit um, um, over a few years. The only thing that's preventing us from using this more widespread is that it's a very expensive therapy at the moment. But the possibility to target um, TTR amyloidosis at multiple different um, stages in, in, in the process and, and improve patient outcomes. So what about those cardiomyopathies that are not amenable to single gene targeting? So, so I'm really talking about the spectrum of disease that are caused by lots of different variants um, or, or the interaction between lots of different variants in the environment. So, so they're not going to be as simple to, to target from a genetic point of view. Can we do anything else? Well, there's been some really interesting work from our colleagues in Maastricht and my colleague Paz Tile in our group at, at the Brompton, which has looked at lots of different people with dilated cardiomyopathy and used lots of um, um, contemporary techniques to try to work out the different disease, disease mechanisms that may drive different groups of patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. And we've identified that there may be inflammatory mechanisms for some, there may be fibrotic mechanisms for others, and others may have um, problems with cardiac metabolism. And, and by looking at the characteristics of these different groups, we may be able to identify patients using fairly simple clinical characteristics and predict which of these mechanisms is going to be most important and then target that using specific therapies. So this phenogrouping approach where we use common clinical characteristics to inform us about the disease mechanisms that are most likely to be playing um, um, a, a prominent role may be a really informative way to, to target those patients who don't have a single genetic cause to their cardiomyopathy. So in conclusion, uh, targeting the specific cause of cardiomyopathies is getting closer. We can either target the primary molecular mechanisms driven by the driven by the genetic variants, or we can try to correct silence or replace um, um, the genetic variant itself. We'll need multiple different approaches because there's a spectrum of different cardiomyopathies caused by a, a, a spectrum of, of, of both genetic and environmental causes. And, and we're still very early in the days of this, so we need to assess the long term efficacy and safety um, before we start using these approaches um, in a widespread manner. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brian. That was really comprehensive and like a really clear way of explaining what is quite complicated science. So thank you very much. I'm sure lots of people will have questions for you. Um, we can come back to that in the panel discussion if you're able to hang around. That would Super. be great. Thanks, um, feel free to put questions in the chat, anyone, if you would like to ask. I'm sure I've got a few questions as well.